Podcasting from the Art Gallery of Mississauga, this is Border Crossings, a podcast where we listen to stories and experiences from artists, innovators, community activators, and people living creative lives. I'm your host, Vasandra, and I can't wait to unpack the magic of Border Crossings with you. Are you curious about living a creative life fearlessly? Then hang tight for a dose of inspiration. We packed the dog in the car and we drove across Canada. And as we drove across Canada, we handed out resumes. And we always said that whatever whatever happens, happens. And wherever the first uh, bite comes, we'll mm-hmm. go there. Podcasting from the Art Gallery of Mississauga, this is Border Crossings, a podcast where we listen to stories and experiences from artists, innovators, community activators, and people living creative lives. I'm your host, Vasandra, and I can't wait to unpack the magic of Border Crossings with you. Are you curious about living a creative life fearlessly? Then hang tight for a dose of inspiration. We're on, we're live. So hi, Linda, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. So, Lina, I have a question for you. Okay. I know that you're a people's person Mm -hmm. and you've been in community engaged arts pretty much all of your life, right? So Mm -hmm. how does this phase feel to you? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I've I've always had art as a passion. Um, And I guess I was trying to think about when it started and I... I realized that there was always music in my home. So I was blessed with parents who just loved to have the stereo up loud and and all different types of music. So that's where I, my mom used to to clean to Rachmaninoff and I thought that was absolutely hilarious. So so there was always music in the home. And um, so I started out just listening and then um, my dad picked up a guitar. He actually traded a Martin D19 for an old push lawnmower. The poor guy didn't know what he got and it's incredible guitar and he started playing, but then he lost interest and he actually gave it to me. Um, and that's when I really started getting into the music, learning to read, learning to listen, um, played a lot just by ear and playing with people that were better than I was. Um, and that's, that's the way I still like, playing my music but I am a musician that way I'm really not that great with the visual art stuff but um, uh, the music is is where I came from so um, it was never a um, how to say I I didn't make a lot of money or money from it Um, it was uh, just something that I just like to do for myself and um, so my career has been into health, wellness, social services. And, uh, and it really wasn't until about 20 years ago when um, I actually became involved career-wise in the arts. And um, my background is definitely community engagement, community development, planning, um, rallying up the troops to kind of get issues out there and, and people um, aware of the importance of the issues that we were um, trying to tell them about. Um, and uh, so that's where the arts in general came in. It was about 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, right now, um, being a musician, um, it is difficult. And it is something that we in the performing arts, um, as well as the, the, I guess, any type of art form, are trying to figure out how do we do our art? How do we make sure that not only is it safe for the artists themselves to get together to perform, but um, for the audience to, to really listen and have an opportunity to be a part of something live. And to me, that's what arts is about. It's about experiencing, being together, feeling that energy and excitement in in the room whether and it didn't it doesn't matter what type of art you're listening to or you're you're a part of there is um, an energy that is exchanged amongst people when they're together appreciating an art form 
And, um, and that's what's missing right now. We can do all we can online and, um, which is wonderful because we still get that experience. It's still not quite the same. And that is the, the, the essence of what we as artists are going to have to figure out in moving forward that, that, that right now our online is our, our boundary is our border, um, that is a, enabling us to to have uh, an exchange, but there's something missing from that exchange, and that is what we need to to look into for moving forward into the future. I hear you there. So, Linda, you mentioned um, getting into music at a really young age, and then being a musician. Uh, I want to know how old were you when you first started exploring? on your own and then how did you kind of um, you know make it official or how was your journey well i guess we as kids going into school i'll always rem I'll, i won't forget sitting in class oh god it must be in uh public school maybe grades two grade three when the teacher brought out the recorder mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, that was a simple instrument and we started playing there, but it was the, the feeling of I'm making music. I'm, I've got my fingers on the notes and, and that's the beginning of it. And I still, actually, I still have the recorder that I used in public school. Um, I have a number of other ones, but I still have that one main one that's kind of being held together with a couple of elastics right now, but that was the beginning. And then I guess, I guess beyond that, it was, when I truly got my the guitar from my dad. And I have to say that was probably um, in my early teens. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to really date myself now because <laughs> that was back in the day where um, in, in the mid 60s. And so that guitar, um, it had its strap and it was hung over my back and it went everywhere with me. And um, I would play in the parks. I would play with my friends. I had, was in a couple of different garage bands um, and, uh, and just did, took it everywhere with me. So that was into the music. Now, when I was in high school, it wasn't until I was in high school that I had the opportunity actually to take up a musical instrument. And the one I chose um, was a French horn. Um, which is interesting because my teacher at the time said, uh, you don't want to play the French horn. And I went, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> and, and he goes, no, you want to play the trombone? I go, no, I don't. And he goes, don't be coming to me in six months and telling me you can't play it. Well, I mean, that's like telling me not to do something. So of course <laughs> I was going to take up the challenge and I haven't looked back since. Now, the sad thing was, is that at the end of high school, um, and back then it was five years, um, I did not have the resources to be able to go out and buy myself a horn. So mm -hmm. I ended up going in and getting my undergrad, getting my master's degree, going out and working for a few years. And it wasn't until I'm trying to remember exactly how long it was. Um, uh, it might, my, my uh, youngest would just turn one years old. And for my birthday, mm -hmm. um, my family rented me a horn mm -hmm. and I hadn't re realized how much I had missed my music, had missed playing mm -hmm. um, until I got the horn and I picked it up. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is turning 32 at the end of this month. And it, so it's been 31 years since I picked it up again. Um, and uh, I've, I'm playing in all sorts of different groups. And I've played in the pit for musical theater um, mm -hmm. productions. And um, so that's how long it's been since I've, I've been playing my horn. That's amazing. That's definitely more than 10,000 hours. So I, we can say that you're a master of the French horn. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You know, I, just, I know I, I've never taken any formal lessons other than high school and that they weren't the greatest uh, lessons back then. But again, it's the same thing is that I get myself into situations and positions where I'm playing with people that are much better than I am. And so I find through an energy exchange, through just sitting beside them, when mm -hmm. they're playing really well, I play really well. 
And so that is the, 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 uh, I guess the momentum that keeps me playing, keeps me out there and, Mm -hmm. um, getting better, um, Mm -hmm. as I, as I go on. So, yeah. So I can see the connection between the way you're saying you get inspired by people who are playing better than you. And I think that's the kind of experience you're trying to recreate with everything that you do with your community work. You're trying to sort of build an environment where people can inspire each other and, you know, get that energy exchange. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, the the interesting analogy with, with, say, playing in an orchestra Mm -hmm. Um, because I play in two bands in an orchestra Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm one player in amongst uh, 40 or 50 other players. Mm -hmm. And so my sound has to fit within the envelope of sound, but my sound is of equal value um, for the most part, unless I'm playing solo. um, Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's of equal value within. So it has it has a place within the, the larger context. And I think that's what we are trying to do within the, the community is look at each individual has a place within the community and a community is a, a some of its, its parts. And, and, and so everyone has value. Everyone has input and what they, they do within that, envelope of community if you want to put it that way Mm -hmm. is is valid and and has a place and so a lot of a lot of times um people kind of dismiss certain sectors within our 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 community and Mm -hmm. they need to be acknowledged they need to be a part of it because they all uh play an important role within that that uh larger context I love that analogy, Uh, Linda. Thank you for sharing that. I want to ask you, while I'm talking to you, I'm I'm picturing this young Linda who has picked up a French horn. And I'm curious to know, why did you pick that instrument of all the instruments? I know your dad gifted you a guitar. And then (laughs) what what motivated you to, what drew you to that instrument? Or why, why did you pick that? Well, I think back in the day, there were a number of, of bands, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I was very heavily into music. Like, music was on all the time. And um, uh, back then, it was when the, this is, the, oh, again, I'm really dating myself. The mm-hmm. first transistor radios, small portable radio. Um, I can't tell you how many batteries I went through um, mm-hmm. because it was always on me and always on. And so I would listen to the music and there were a couple of, of groups that actually had this really mellow alto instrument yeah. that was playing. And I, 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 I listened and I loved the sound. I mean, yeah. if I had had access to a, to a strings at that time, I probably would have picked the cello because it was in the same it's in the same alto range as the horn, but the horn just has this melancholy, um, but a soft um, uh, sound to it that, mm-hmm. and even when you're really um, pushing it and blasting it, um, mm-hmm. it still has that quality of sound that just resonated with me. And that's what, that's what pushed me towards that particular instrument. I had no idea um uh, how to play it. I didn't have any idea that actually it's the hardest brass instrument because it has the <laughs> smallest mouthpiece. I'm going, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, <laughs> I was just going to ask you, I was just going to ask you, did you even know how challenging it's going to be? What, what sort of uh, the road ahead, you know? No, I had absolutely no idea because the one, <laughs> the one thing that's really, um, you have to have a good ear because um, you have to, you can blow into a horn but you have to know what note you're searching for. You have yeah. to, within, again, because you can blow in and you get a, a million different notes out of, uh, you know, just blowing it. And it's all, all controlled through how tight your, your um, embouchure is or how loose it is, and whether you get the high note or whether you get the low note. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I had no idea. And so, uh, but I, I really took to it now. In, in high school, again, I was so into music mm-hmm. that horn was my first, but then I, because I picked up the B flat trumpet mm-hmm. um, and played in the jazz band with it. 
And then mm-hmm. I wasn't challenged enough. So I decided, heck, I'm going to pick up the sa- alto saxophone and play in the junior band with that. So I was <laughs> constantly exploring different opportunities and different instruments to see um, what kind of sound I could get out of them as well. But the horn was basically my main instrument and still is to this day. Linda, I know that you've had a pretty much um, a vast amount of experience in community work and social work. Is there a career highlight that you would like to share with us? I've done some really interesting things and I've been blessed to have opportunities throughout my, my career. Um, I ha- There's a couple of them I can think of. Um, I had the opportunity um, when I was the National Executive Director of Child Find Canada to go on a major promotional and publicity, um, uh, I guess, partnership with Bugle Boy Jeans. That's back in the day again. Um, and um, But it was to try to wait, raise awareness of um, missing children, mm-hmm. um, runaways specifically, and um, and hence the reason why um, we partnered with Bugle Boy Jeans. Uh, they actually created a giant balloon, like with a basket, um, to and we flew it across Canada. Mm-hmm. We dipped the feet in, and I was there when we dipped our feet in the Pacific Ocean, mm-hmm. and we got into this balloon and. Um, you know, went to different towns and cities. Now, of course, we we didn't fly it over the Rockies because that was just a little dangerous. But, um, and of course, I didn't stay with it the whole time, but it was just exciting enough to be um, a part of the whole process. So I started with it. I ended up with it in the Atlantic provinces. And, and of course, when it was in the Toronto, greater Toronto area, um, we were able to um, do a lot of pu- publicity there. So it was a really interesting and fun time um, to be a part of, of uh, that process. And, um, uh, and, and my career has always been with organizations. And I've, I've, I wanted to always be um, at a, a level within um, a movement. I'm going to put it that way. Mm-hmm. where I could help a greater number of people by what I was contributing to the organization. So mm-hmm. certainly I could have done social work on a one-on-one basis. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to be um, that once removed so that I could work in that, to enable other people to work on the one-on-one basis and s- spread the the word about the need in the community. So that was, that was where I was um, Mm -hmm. with, with all my organization. And then with, um, once I was finished with Child Find Canada, I actually worked with a, um, a software company who had created, um, uh, I guess, uh, they, they, it was a piece of software that enabled police officers to create composite pictures of, of the people they were looking for on a computer. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to go to the States and work with uh, John Walsh of America's Most Wanted on -hmm. his show. And so we would tape the show on the Friday night and on the Saturday night, I'd be with the police officers sitting in the studios when the uh, segment aired and the calls Mm -hmm. were coming in for the community And we would sit there and we would create these composite pictures to try to find um, the the people that were perpetrating the the crimes out there. And that was a fascinating process just to watch the way the show was created and then um, listen to the people calling in and then the officers actually creating these pictures and seeing the the this person's face come up on the screen. Um, It was it was uh, really an incredible experience. It sounds fascinating, Linda. Yeah. Um, and I really want to know, this is this kind of work, it isn't for everyone. I, I'm curious to know if there was a turning point in your life that pretty much, you know, drew you to this particular life. It was one professor mm-hmm. in undergrad that um, uh, he really kind of changed the way I looked at life. And we we had... 
uh, like a um well there was myself and and another person where we took the two of us were the only people in a class we mm -hmm. took a private class with him mm -hmm. and we read books about community development the impact that one person can have on a greater number of people and how did they get um, a following charles manson mm -hmm. how did he uh, convince all these people to follow him and yet he was such a horrendous guy you know mm -hmm. so we read books like helter skelter and that sort of thing so and i remember mm -hmm. i remember sitting in a um a classroom now i was married at the time um mm -hmm. and i sat there um in a classroom i remember turning to my 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 husband and said you know what i want to go on and get a master's degree and mm -hmm. i want to do it in community development we got to figure out how do we make this work mm -hmm. And um, so we ended up deciding that the best way to do it was to get a master's in social work, mm -hmm. um, look at the micro as well as the macro. Mm -hmm. And then um, as soon as I finished my, my, um, my, my degree, we mm -hmm. actually, um, it, was, it was back in the day when it was kind of far, hard to find full-time jobs. We packed the dog in the car mm -hmm. and we drove across Canada. And mm -hmm. as we drove across Canada, we handed out resumes. And we always said wow. that whatever whatever happens, happens. And wherever the first uh, bite comes, we'll mm -hmm. go there. And we ended up in a small town in northeastern Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's where our first jobs, full-time jobs were um, regionally. Um, you know, we worked regionally. And mm -hmm. not only with the, the people in the, the region um, for the town folk and the um, the people on their the ranches and stuff around because it was certainly in the middle of cattle country mm -hmm. um, but also uh, on the reservations with mm -hmm. the Aboriginal so that was another whole experience as well all around that that time frame mm -hmm. and um, so those sort of things really started pushing it forward and pushing the envelope and and so I always found that that's where I needed to be is that is working with the greater number of people to mm. influence and make the change at that one level up from the individual. And I think I found your superpower. My suit. What's my superpower? <laughs> You're curious. You're oh, unending yeah. curious. And I love that. I well, I mean, I mean, it's all about lifelong learning. I mean, and that's why. I, and so I mean, you, when you look at who I am and, and Thanks for joining us on this episode. This podcast is an extension of the Border Crossings Project, a community-engaged arts project funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, the Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Mississauga. Do you have a story to share with us? Are you living a creative life out there on your own? Well, I'm keen to hear from you. Write to me at agmconnect at mississauga.ca. Thank <laughs> you.